I would like to introduce our next speaker, Lindsay Reynolds. Lindsay is a riparian ecologist whose research centers on plants, eco-hydrology, climate change, and invasions. Lindsay is with the Department of Biology at Colorado State University and the U.S. Geological Survey in Fort Collins. Lindsay's presenting on climate change in riparian forest communities, implications for small streams in the Upper Colorado River Basin. Please welcome Lindsay Reynolds. Thank you. Today I'd like to talk about some work that I've been doing with my research advisor, Pat Shafroth at the USGS and our collaborator at Colorado State University, Leroy Poff, uh, looking at climate change and riparian forests in the upper Colorado. So I'd like to step back. Um, big picture effects of climate change in the western US, uh, as with everywhere, we're looking at observed and predicted increases in CO2 observed and predicted increases in temperatures. Uh, changes in precipitation in this region are more equivocal. Some models show slight increases. Some models show uh, status quo as, as far as precipitation inputs. But what these are, le are likely to lead to are increasing evaporative demand in the region, increasing aridity and drought, um, as Dave talked about. Less snow uh, as uh, falling as less precipitation falling as snow, and earlier snow melt timing, which will have huge consequences for rivers, and longer, drier summers in the region. So, what does this mean for riparian systems? Changes in temperature, precipitation, and CO2 will have both direct and indirect effects on riparian ecosystems. Uh, included in the direct effects of climate change are uh, impacts on growth, survival, and reproduction water status and phenology, um, as well as impacts on species distributions. And that usually means um, movement of species distributions northward or up in elevation in most cases. Uh, changes in community composition under new climate uh, scenarios. So there will be some winners and some losers in terms of community composition. And, and then also impacts on trophic interactions in these riparian ecosystems. And then there'll be a suite of indirect effects of climate changes, usually mediated through stream flow. So changes to timing of high and low flows, uh, changes to magnitude of high and low flows, these will have consequences for the riparian ecosystems. Changes to the spatial and uh, temporal extent of inundation on floodplains. Changes in water temperature, usually increases in water temperatures on, uh, in these riverine systems. And then also geomorphic changes that are um, being driven by climate change. And these will all uh, loop back and have effects on uh, these key components of riparian eco ecosystems. Today I'm going to be focusing on low flows and looking at what are some of the potential effects of changes in low flows, specifically reduced low flows on riparian plant ecosystems. So let's put this in the context of restoration. Can restoration help buffer some of the negative effects of climate change? And the answer is absolutely yes. So restoration can ameliorate climate change effects through a variety of mechanisms. Restoring environmental flows can help buffer uh, some of the negative effects of climate change. And this will occur in most cases where restoration is moving um, environmental flows in the opposite direction of climate change. So for example, if climate change is projected to reduce peak flows, um, then in cases where we can restore, um, restore peak flows, that will help buffer some of the negative effects of climate change. Restoring geomorphic complexity and floodplain connect connectivity will help uh, buffer climate change effects, restoring habitat diversity. And then these top three will all help increase resiliency in the face of climate change in these riparian ecosystems. When we're thinking about planning restoration in the context of climate change, uh, it will be important to, take, to keep in mind some key things, such as um, incorporating climate projections and scenarios, um, incorporating stream flow projections and scenarios into restoration planning, how, and then further, how target species and 
target communities may shift under climate change um, and looking at those different possibilities. And then when we're thinking about climate change and looking at model projections, we always have to consider um, the uncertainty in those model projections. So what are the error bars around some of these estimates? And what are the consequences for that, those ranges of um, uncertainty for uh, restoration success and for what our communities are gonna look like um, in the future? And so when we're considering uncertainty and model projections, then to consider alternatives in restoration planning and think about how we can um, mitigate that uncertainty going forward in the future. So today I'm gonna focus on one aspect of the restoration uh, tool, toolbox, so how target species and target communities may shift in the future. So when we're thinking about this question, how, how will species and communities shift in the future, we can target our restoration um, efforts using a variety of, of tools. And so some of those tools um, that will be important in this context are um, first to identify genotypes of species that may be better adapted for future conditions. So which, um, for a given species, which genotypes uh, might be more adapted for potentially drier conditions? Another tool that could be implemented would be to model riparian communities and to identify functional groups that will perform better under future conditions. Um, another tool would be uh, to look at regional species lists that include uh, tolerances and adaptations to different environmental conditions. So this is what Dave was talking about, thinking about uh, functional guilds and which, which species and which groups of species fall into the categories that will actually benefit under future conditions. And then uh, and, uh, the last tool I wanna talk about is to use analog ecosystems for examples of appropriate plant communities under future conditions. So for example, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is in, in the situation where the f uh, projections are for a drier future, let's look for neighboring communities adjacent to uh, where we want to restore and uh, look to, the, to drier neighboring communities a, as examples of uh, communities that are already doing well under drier conditions and then incorporate that um, into our restoration. So I'm gonna be talking about the Upper Colorado River Basin. Dave gave great introduction to the whole basin and the Upper Colorado is, uh, is shown here in the black um, outline and it's the whole river basin upstream of Lee's Ferry, so upstream of Lake Powell. It includes parts of five states. It's mostly southwestern Wyoming, eastern Utah, and western Colorado. And just to touch again on the climate and hydrology in this region in particular, uh, we're observing and we have projections for warmer temperatures, more frequent, longer, and more severe droughts. Stream flows in late spring and summer have already declined and are projected to um, continue declining. And mean annual stream flow over the course of the year is projected to decrease uh, between six and 25% over the next 100 years. So lots of indications that we're moving towards a drier climate. So our hypothesis going into this research uh, was twofold. First, that in arid and semi-arid regions of the western US where intermittent streams are common, so intermittent streams that go dry during some period of the, of, of the year, minimum flows will decrease and some perennial streams will shift from perennial flow to into the intermittent flow um, category under climate driven changes. And then further, um, changes in minimum flows, volume and duration will uh, then affect stream de dependent communities, such as riparian plants, stream invertebrates, and fish. And today I'm gonna focus on the riparian plants. So our driving research questions were, what is the potential for streams in the upper Colorado basin to shift from perennial to intermittent under a warmer climate? And what, how will riparian plants in this region respond to those changes in low flow? So what are the consequences for riparian plant communities? Uh, so for under that first research question, the hydrology-based question, we did a historical stream gauge analysis and we selected gauges across the basin. We selected about 115 gauges that had minimal human impact on these streams. They tended to be uh, smaller streams and also had a, a, a good amount of 
um, records. So they had to have at least eight years of, of data. We m modeled the relationship between flow metrics. So we extracted flow metrics from the this, this stream gauge records. Flow metrics such as mean annual flow, annual low flow, flow variability, number of zero flow days, metrics like that for each stream gauge. And we modeled the relationship between flow metrics and environmental variables such as climate uh, data, land use, uh, land cover, geology. Um, and we modeled the relationship between flow metrics and environmental variables using c conditional inference trees and random forests. We then used the results from these models to project stream flow metrics um, to ungauge reaches across the study area. We modeled perenniality, so we uh, categorize the streams into bins of perenniality. So we had three bins, perennial, strongly intermittent, and weakly intermittent. And then we use the results from two and three to illustrate potential thresholds of stream intermittency under a drier future climate. So where are those thresholds and which streams are mo potentially most vulnerable to shifting from perennial to intermittent? What we found is that the landscape's variable is most associated with aridity, such as precipitation, potential evapotranspiration, or PET, and percent snow cover during the winter were most important for predicting mean and minimum flow metrics. And that under drying summer conditions, perennial streams that had high minimum flow CV, so high minimum flow coefficient of variation, which is an indicator of variability, and lower mean flows those are the streams that are, will be most at risk of shifting towards intermittency. So high variability, low flow. The, this is the uh, result of our conditional inference tree model. And uh, what this type of um, analysis does is it, it takes your data and it finds um, significant breakpoints and bins, bins the data um, according to thresholds where uh, there are these significant breaks. And, uh, what we found is that the streams with high variability, so minimum CV greater than 230%, that's really high variability. These are the most intermittent streams. And then with moderate amounts of minimum variability, on the higher end of that spectrum, these are moderately intermittent streams that included some perennial streams. And then the low variability uh, streams were, were mostly perennial. So what we found most interesting was this group of streams here which were high, high variability, greater than 61% minimum flow variability, and low stream flow, low mean annual stream flow. This included perennial streams and weekly intermittent streams that were on the drier end of the spectrum. So uh, we used these thresholds that the model came up with to identify these streams that are mostly perennial, some weekly intermittent, um, and suggest that these are the streams that are most uh, likely to shift towards uh, intermittency in the future. And so we took this model and we projected across stream reaches in the basin. And what I'm showing here, using those, uh, using those thresholds that we found, the 61% minimum flow CV and 0.09 um, specific mean daily flow, we were able to color code the streams according to these thresholds. So the red streams are um, streams that are likely to shift. So they fall underneath these th thresholds and the blue streams fall outside the threshold. So the blue streams are either very perennial and unlikely to shift at all um, towards intermittency or very intermittent and already on the very dry end of the spectrum. So the streams that we are calling more threatened to shift towards intermittency, the red streams um, tended to be at higher elevations or, or moderate elevations. Um, so looking more in the, in the foothill areas. Uh, and so we're able to come up with this tool and um, we'd be able to go out and uh, ground truth these to see what these streams look like on the ground. So this is a potential tool moving forward. And this work is uh, currently under review at, at the Journal of Hydrology. So then linking on to that, what are these shifts towards drier hydrology, what are the consequences for riparian plant communities? So to get at this question, we uh, established sites across the basin, we, uh, 54 sites across the basin, along a gradient from wet to dry streams. So we created the, the gradient um, from wet to dry streams 
by sampling a mix of intermittent and perennial streams at low and high elevation. And so we had this uh, dry to wet gradient. So our driest streams were intermittent streams at low elevation, and then slightly wetter were perennial streams at low elevation, and then we went up in elevation to intermittent streams at high elevation. So those were slightly wetter. Um, they got snowpack during the winter, so their soil moistures were higher. And then the wettest streams we sampled were perennial streams at high elevation. At each site, we sampled the riparian plant community. We established transects perpendicular to the stream channel and used point intercept sampling along those transects. And then we also sampled the floodplain uh, geomorphology. So we established cross sections and did a topographic survey of the bottomland cross section so we could understand the elevations of the floodplain surfaces as you move away from the channel and how those relate to the plant communities growing on the surfaces. So we looked at these plant community data in, in several different ways. The first way we looked at it was with a univariate analysis, um, looking at plant category types. Um, so along the bottom, ax along the x-axis here are, are plant categories. We had total cover, annuals, perennials, wetland species, exotic, native, and then we had a, a suite of uh, functional types, forbs, grasses, shrubs, and trees. And then the bars indicate the wetness, where, where each uh, stream fell on the wetness index. So the dark bars are perennial high elevation, the gray bars are, per, are intermittent high, the gray hatch bars are perennial low elevation, and then the white hatch bars are intermittent low. So moving in each category, moving from left to right, we're getting drier. So the wettest streams are on the left, the drier streams are on the right. And um, we found a couple significant patterns in these data. Um, we found that total cover decreased as you got, w moved drier along the spectrum. Annuals, um, annual plant cover increased as you moved drier along the spectrum. Perennial, um, perennial plant cover decreased. We didn't see a significant pattern in wetland or exotic plants, but we did see a significant decrease in native plant cover as you move along this gradient. And then we didn't see any strong patterns in the functional groups uh, that we identified along this gradient. We also did a multivariate analysis of the plant communities. So each, uh, each symbol here represents one site, and we coded them. Uh, the circles are intermittent streams, and the triangles are perennial streams. And what you might be able to see is that the circles and the, and the triangles are pretty well mixed. So we didn't see strong differentiation between the two um, stream hydrology groups. So we didn't see significant differentiation between the intermittent versus perennial. However, um, we coded the high elevation in the black and the low elevation in the gray, and that's where we saw more differentiation. Oops. So the high elevation uh, tended to group together down here to the left, and the lower elevation uh, tended to group here to the right. So we saw more differentiation across the elevational wetness gradients than we saw across the perennial versus intermittent gradient, which was pretty interesting. And then last, we looked at characteristic species for each of the plant communities. And this is where I think um, a, this, I think this tool could really be used um, effectively in restoration, where we came up with the, which species were most characteristic of each of these types of plant communities. So we have um, our wetness gradient, uh, our, the elevational gradient here um, from top to bottom. So the, the top boxes signify sites um, high elevation. The bottom boxes signify sites at low elevation. So moving wet to dry from top to bottom. And then from left to right, um, the wet sites are on the right, the perennial stream flow sites are on the right, and then the intermittent stream flow sites are on the left, so moving wet to dry, right to left. And then locally, we're, I'm showing here the gradient uh, from the channel moving away up, up higher in the floodplain. So that's also a, a local scale wet to dry gradient at each site. So I'm able to signify here, um, here are the species growing near the channel, the most um, hydric, wet loving species and as you move up in surfaces, as you move away from the channel, you get drier species 
um, in each case. So how can we use this kind of tool in restoration? I would suggest that uh, if, if we have a site where we're restoring a uh, stream reach, we identify where that site falls on the spectrum. For example, say we're working on a perennial stream at low elevation, and then in light of climate change, this stream is likely to get drier. So let's go look slightly drier on the spectrum to, for potential species or potential communities that would do well in future conditions. So if we're trying to restore a perennial stream at low elevation, let's look drier on the spectrum. Let's go over here, look at what's growing in these plant communities, and think about how to facilitate um, those drier communities at this site. Or another, um, at the more local scale, we can look at the higher surfaces. These, the plants growing at the higher surfaces are um, existing in drier conditions, and so uh, this would be a good place to potentially move some of the drier species to facilitate their establishment down lower, closer to the channel, and at, in, in future conditions, they would um, likely be able to persist uh, longer than some of the wetter species who might need, um, need the wetter conditions. So in summary, our, our work, our research in this area show that under drying conditions, total abundances in cover in these communities are likely to decrease over time. Annual plants are likely to increase and perennials are likely to decrease and native plants um, are likely to decrease. And then we found that differences between communities among elevation groups, so low to high, were more distinct than differences between perennial and intermittent streams. And what this indicates is that direct effects of climate that dom dominate across elevational gradients. So what, uh, what are these plants subjected to um, over the course of the year in terms of uh, pre precipitation and temperature regimes? Those are likely to determine the most dramatic changes in plant community composition, while changes in stream hydrology may drive more subtle changes um, over the long term. So what are the implications for restoration? So as I suggested, Understanding the, how, how communities shift along this gradient, um, we can look along this gradient to find communities and species to target for successful restoration in the future. And then also um, these findings up here that uh, if, we're, if we're thinking about how to restore a, a community that is going to be subject to drier conditions in the future, um, if we want more native plants in that particular community, we're going to have to think carefully about how to facilitate that because um, given no intervention, it's likely for that cover to decrease. Um, but if we think about which plants are going to do well, let's think about planting more um, annual plants and facilitating that type of community because those are likely to do better. So with that, I'd like to thank our funders the Bureau of Reclamation Water Smart Program, the Southern Rockies Landscape Conservation Cooperative, the USGS Climate Effects Network, and the USGS Invasive Species Program, and then all the folks who helped us with field and logistical help at the various land management agencies. We worked all over the basin, and so we had a lot of help from folks, and then our field and logistical support was essential. Thank you. We, that was one of the biggest challenges. So there are more than a thousand stream gauges in the upper Colorado basin. We ended up only working with about a hundred. So what we did was um, we decided to eliminate gauges on very large rivers. So we didn't look at the main stem Colorado um, or the, many of the main stem large rivers because those are unlikely to shift uh, to intermittent because of their large discharge to start out with. So that eliminated a lot of the heavily regulated rivers to start out with. We looked at um, where the dams were, so any stream that had a large dam on the main stem took those out. Uh, we looked at the USGS uh, informational sheets for each gauge sometimes has information on diversions, um, so we, we took that diversion information into account. Um, so we looked at a, a suite of different, we tried to gather as much information about each stream and then we, we developed a, a threshold for diversion. So some of the streams that we included, we had to include some streams that, that had diversions, otherwise we wouldn't have any in our sample set, but we um, minimized the diversion. So we said less than 20% of mean annual flow um, 
diverted during the growing season. So we, we came up with some thresholds and criteria for um, human impact on, on the streams and then narrowed it down from there. But we, we really tried to minimize, um, we, we tried to use streams that were, had minimal impacts. It was, it's impossible to eliminate it all together though. Good question. Dave? Yeah, great question. So we, we didn't... Can you repeat the question? Oh, uh, Dave asked how we took into account groundwater and its influence on perenniality. The way we did it in our modeling effort was to incorporate um, layers related to geology, hoping that differences in geology would um, account for differences in uh, groundwater re recharge. There, are, there aren't any um, large-scale... Uh, GIS layers and information on the, at the resolution that we wanted for groundwater information for the basin. So geology was was how we dealt with that in our large scale modeling effort. Um, yeah. In the back. What about ephemeral streams? It seems like to me that a lot of those streams are showing an active ephemeral. So yes, we did not differentiate. Oh, yeah, right. Um, the question was, how did we deal with ephemeral streams? And uh, we didn't, so we didn't differentiate between intermittent and ephemeral. And uh, the way I would define um, intermittent is intermittent are streams that go dry uh, seasonally after snow melt and um, during, during a period during the summer. And ephemeral streams are streams that flow only in response to, uh, to specific storm events. So we, the, a lot of the streams in the southern part of the basin are likely to be ephemeral, and we just didn't have the resolution of information to differentiate hydrologically between that gradient. But, um, but yes, I do, we do discuss that in our work, how uh, the streams on the drier end of that spectrum, and a, a lot of those low elevation, drier streams are um, likely to be ephemeral streams. So the question is the the map of our stream hydrology that we pr where we projected stream flow metrics and illustrated some of the thresholds that we found is that going to be available um, online or available to managers and the answer is uh, yes so that those data are currently under review so it's not available at the moment but we're working with the Colorado State University GIS Centroid that has a database of information on the Colorado River Basin online in a GIS format, and so um, they're going to be able to host those data um, through their Colorado River Basin database, um, and so the data are going to be available there after they uh, complete the review process. Let's give Lindsay a big hand. 